You got Maga Mac here on Birds 365, and we got Mr. Mike Sielski looking good, ready to shoot the breeze on Eagles with us here on Birds 365. Uh, Mike, how was your Easter? How was your uh, April Fool's Day? <laughs> My April Fool's Day was full free. Uh, thank full you for asking, Jody. Nice. Yeah. And uh, Easter Sunday was excellent. Hope you guys are doing well. Very uh, nice. Thank you for jumping in. Um, I want to start with Hassan Reddick because we've been uh, we talked about him all day yesterday. Unfortunately, he didn't come down till Friday after Birds 365 was over and done with. Eagles do that to us a lot. Um, but it, they were kept it from everybody by doing a new dump Friday announcement. Um, everybody's got an opinion on whether it's a win or a loss. I know that it's, it's something that you have to take time to evaluate. You can't just say day of trade. Oh, that's a win. Oh, that's a loss. Sometimes they're pretty close to being obvious. This is one that you're surely going to have to wait for, but we all like to speculate on whether it will become a win or a loss. Howie Roseman get a win or a loss with this on Reddick trade? I think he probably got a loss, but it's possibly got a win. I think losing Hassan makes them worse next season. I think the chances are good. That's what's going to happen because he's a really good player and he's in the prime of his career and four straight years of double-digit sacks is all the evidence you need that he's one of the premier pass rushers in the NFL. And the chances that Bryce Huff is going to replicate that production from the outside looking in aren't great. Now, having said that, I understand why they made the trade. Uh, Hassan wasn't going to re-sign here for the money he wanted. You don't want to keep a guy who's going to be unhappy like that around if you can avoid it if you're an NFL team. And it's certainly possible that Bryce Huff will develop into uh, a terrific pass rusher. But for next season, I think they're a little worse off for not having Hassan Reddick. Yeah, Mike, I you know, I think it's more about Nolan Smith than Bryce Huff. I think of Hassan's here. Now you got to work something out. Long term, you're right. They don't want to pay him 20 plus million. He probably wants up to 25 million because as you point out, he deserves to be one of the top page edge rushers by product productivity standpoints. Um, but even if he stayed and we pretend you don't worry, you're in a vacuum, you don't worry about the locker room, you don't worry if he's unhappy, and you say, all right, Reddick's going to play, Sweat's going to play, Hub's going to play. Nolan Smith isn't going to play in that circumstance, or he's going to get the scraps. And we know how GMs are in this league when it comes to the first-round picks. They want them to succeed. They need them. Howie, a little bit less than most people. Mm -hmm. Most need them to succeed. I think it's more about Nolan Smith. You buy that part of it? Yeah, I think you make a good case for that, John, too. Um, and for any team, the Eagles included, to sustain success in the NFL, and this is something that doesn't get talked about enough, I feel like, but and should be talked about more, they need the guys that they drafted to develop, and they have to be given time to develop. And in some cases, and this is the part that doesn't get discussed, you draft a guy and he doesn't make an immediate impact, and you have to give him the opportunity to make that impact, and you have to roll the dice that he's going to make that impact. And that's where the Eagles are with Nolan Smith. That's where they are to a large degree with Jordan Davis, and that's to a certain degree, where they are with Jalen Carter. They drafted these guys to replace the Hassan Reddicks and Brandon Grahams and Fletcher Coxes, and they have to do that. Otherwise, this whole system doesn't work. If you miss on those picks, you're not going to be able to get back to the Super Bowl and keep competing in the NFC East. And the Eagles need some indications here that they hit on those picks. And I think you're right. Nolan Smith has to be better in his second year than he was in his first. And the Eagles, to a certain degree, have to take a calculated risk that he will be. Now, that calculated risk is going to be shared by some because even this past week at the owners' meeting, Nick Sirianni went back in again and said, yeah, I'm trying to win games. Howie says we're trying to develop players, and Nick says we're trying to win games. Well, that's what happened last year. Nolan Smith didn't play because – the coaching staff evaluated we got a better chance to win if we're going to keep running BG out there and not the uh, push to get Nolan Smith in. You got a new defensive coordinator in Vic Fangio. Howie Roseman, as John is speculating here, did this Reddick deal in part to open up a spot for Nolan Smith to get on the field that much more. 
What if the new DC says, you know, I he's not showing me anything in practice, didn't show anything in the preseason. We give him a smattering of snaps here and there, and he doesn't get anything done. What happens when Vic Fangio says, yeah, I'm here to win games. And sorry, Howie, that you took him in the first round. I won't hear when you took him in the first round. I'm going to put the best player out there that I can to win a game. Yeah, what happens is probably Vic Fangio is going to win out. Uh, at least in the short term, and then they're going to have to make a decision one way or another. It's similar to the Jalen Rager situation, right? Uh, they kept running Rager out there because he was a first-round pick. He continued to not be productive. He continued to drop passes and prove that he wasn't worth a first-round uh, status, and they eventually got rid of him, uh, and they then had to spend more resources to improve their wide receiver position by trading for A.J. Brown. So it will out, uh, but in the short term, the coach is going to win. Uh, because unless Howie comes down from on high in week two or three and says, oh, no, you got to put Nolan Smith out there, Vic Fangio is going to do what he thinks he needs to do to win NFL games. That's the way this works. Yeah, and that's why I go back to Smith, Mike. I'm a big Moneyball fan, the movie. Love the movie. Uh, I think it was very well done. In the movie, Brad Pitt, it's Billy Bean, for those who haven't seen it. Uh, the great uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who passed away, was uh, Art Howe the Aces manager. He didn't want to play Scott Hatterberg in the movie. It is overblown Hollywood, but uh, so what did Brad Pitt do? He traded, traded him. the guy in front of him. Yep. So he had to play him. I think how he kind of Billy beamed it said, all right, you're not going to play him. You're, you don't have this guy. You might as well play him. Any of that sprinkling into it? I think there's got to be. I mean, look, I don't know that for certain, but no. these are the kind of machinations that happen in yeah. professional sports franchises. The and, and guys know this. I remember a couple of years ago, John, um, you might remember this. You might have been there or at least on the call this day. It was the end of the 2020 season, and there was all this discussion about why Alshon Jeffrey was playing ahead at the end of that season over Travis right. Fulgham, okay? Yeah. And... <laughs> Yeah, the great Travis Fulgham. Yes. And I asked Jason Kelsey about that on one of those Zoom calls we had back then. And Kelsey basically said, look, we're in the business of winning games. We are not in the business of developing players, no matter what a front office thinks. Yeah. And at the time, in that moment, even though the Eagles season was completely lost, Alshon Jeffrey was going to play ahead of Travis Fulgham because Doug Peterson thought, Alshon Jeffrey gave the Eagles a better chance to win each week than Travis Fulgham did. And that sort of mentality is very common and very accepted in locker rooms. So the guys in there are going to know if Brandon Graham is outplaying Nolan Smith, the guys in that room are going to know. Yeah. Keep that in mind. And I'll just say for uh, Howie Roseman's sake, Zach Bond better not be outplaying Nolan Smith. Because if he is, even though he's Andrew Van Geek light, he's not supposed to be on the field more than your first round draft pick from the year before was. But I would not be surprised if uh, the new defense reporter says, I'm playing my best football players in my system. We shall see. A guy who probably deserves to be in the full-time rotation, and the Eagles certainly made a commitment to him yesterday, was Reed Blankenship. Got a contract extension, extra year added on, some good guaranteed money but still relatively inexpensive for a starting safety in this league. Uh, Blankenship, like everyone else on defense, had a less than stellar second half of the season last year. How he likes to do this. How he likes to kind of take a roll of the dice and say, yes, I'm putting my official stamp of approval by giving a player a contract extension before we have to. Reed Blankenship going to be a 90, 95% on the field guy for the Eagles this year? Yeah, probably. Um, but the draft is still ahead. We're still a month out from it. So it's possible that they'll bring in somebody who could challenge. Look, Sidney Brown looked okay at times last season. Uh, but, you know, does bringing Reed Blankenship get me excited to think that they have uh, the sequel to Malcolm Jenkins and Brian Dawkins? No. Uh, he's a fine player. He's okay. You know, he's not a huge difference maker. If anything, he'll solidify a spot just through continuity uh, as opposed to uh, lifting the defense to a level that it really needs to get to. Yeah, I well, I, I, I don't – do we sometimes get blinded by that UDFA 
um, tag Mike, similar to first round pick, but the opposite direction. And, you know, Reed will always be undrafted. He got signed for five grand. I don't know. He's out there. He's making plays. He was one of the steadiest players on the Eagles defense last season when he was healthy and he's got to be able to stay on the field, but he's an undrafted free agent. Is it tough for you? I know it's tough for me um, to put that in the rear view more. We just went through it with TJ Edwards. Um, undrafted, undrafted, keeps playing well, keeps playing well. At some point, you got to turn the page, right, and say, all right, this kid's pretty good. I, that's where I'm kind of with Reed Blankenship. Yeah, Blankenship is fine. I, I, I'm not arguing that part, John, at all. And I think you're right to a large degree that how a guy comes into a league colors how people look at him. I just know that that defense wasn't very good last year, no. and Reed Blankenship yeah. was on the field for quite a yeah. bit of it. So it's not as if bringing him back is all, all of a sudden going to reverse the course of what we saw last season. There are some other steps the Eagles need to take to fix what went wrong on that defense. Yeah, he did lead the league, uh, led the Eagles in tackles and interceptions. That's two pretty good categories for me. So I, I do like the Reed Blankenship extension. All right, Mike, one thing that uh, was announced yesterday was the Eagles offseason program. And apparently they're going to do a little bit more work than they have the last couple of years, more days, mandatory mini camp, something they haven't done the last couple of years as well. And it's understandable with the way they collapsed last year that they feel the need to shake it up. Good on them for that. But Nick Sirianni's going to be the guy who's going to have to deal with this, although it's an organizational decision. If either one of you guys want to argue that with me, no, 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 Nick, Nick implemented this, even though we think Nick would is probably good with this and happy with this. I don't believe it was Nick Sirianni's decision for a minute. I believe this was an organizational decision, but there'll be some players that are going, wait a minute. We got used to camp fed here. What, what are we doing all of this work for? Well, is Jason and Fletch are gone now. They so are. That's, that's exact. That's exactly yeah. what I was going to say, John, yeah. is that, you have these two key members of the team who have been around for so long and who know how to prepare for a season and don't need the grind of a more intense training camp. They're not there now. And I think if anybody on that roster wants to complain about the Eagles hitting it a little harder during training camp at the preseason, then Nick Sirianni should fire up the tape of that New England game in week one. And he should fire up any of the final seven games yeah. that they played at the end of the season and say, hey, guys, we've got to be sharper. And if preparing more in training camp gets us there, then we're going to try it. I look at that as kind of like a sliding scale. It all depends on the nature of the roster and the nature of the team and the aftermath, the season you're coming off of. Can you take your foot off the gas pedal a little bit if you're coming off a Super Bowl berth with some older players and some key spots? Sure. Do you need to put – a little more gas, you know, put your foot down a little harder when you're coming off a collapse like the Eagles did and those older players aren't around. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that either. Yeah. And and the ones that are around, Brandon, I remember when Doug Peterson inserted maintenance days, instituted maintenance days, Brandon didn't even take them. I mean, Brandon likes to practice. He's that right. rare. Um, and Lane, they'll probably be cautious with him. And that's fine. Everybody knows who Lane Johnson is. So I don't think it creates that much of a, a disconnect on the team. I don't think there's going to be many young players saying, hey, I should be like Lane Johnson. If they are, you can show them the door pretty quickly. Right. Um, Jeffrey Lurie, let's talk Jeffrey Lurie. You did a nice uh, piece on that and, and you know, going global. And I always talk about how fast the NFL moves. Uh, Mike, you went way back. 2005 when Jeffrey was concerned about going global, um, so to speak, and all the different things, all the obvious things, competitive advantage. If you give up a home game, um, you know, what does it do to your fan base? Um, player safety, because you don't have necessarily, especially in certain circumstances, Mexico recently, you don't have the fields you have here. Um, all of that factors into it. Nobody cares now <laughs> because no. they got they got to generate more revenue streams and they pretty much topped out here. That's how I look at it. Is that how you look at it? Yeah, look, they perceive that there's no more worlds to be conquered uh, in the continental United States. That's how the NFL is looking at this. And so they're going to inflict 
American football on other countries, whether they like it or not, and whether the fan base here in America likes it or not. I don't mean to sound like uh, some kind of jingoistic, nationalistic um, Yahoo here, but at some level, you have to keep your core fan base in mind. You would think. One would think. And, you know, here we are. We're going to, the Eagles are going to open the season in Brazil. Uh, they're, the NFL is now putting two games on Christmas Day. Jody, I told you that they were going to go to a game every single day of the week, and they're going to do it. Wednesday. Uh, yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, um, awful. And, and at some point, maybe I'm really wrong about this, and, may, and maybe the NFL can just do whatever it wants, and its fans will follow along as if the league is the Pipe Piper. Maybe I'm really wrong about this. But at some point, I would think there's going to be a backlash where fans just say to themselves, you know what, uh, too much for me, too much, you know. And and the other part is, too, scarcity is part of what makes the NFL as popular yeah. as it is. And, and here's an even deeper point I would make, guys. So much of our society now is feels unsettled. And I know this is a small thing, but I think there are certain – there's certain value in having certain institutions kind of not change. And when it comes to sports, the NFL, I think it gains value and it's better when it has a lot of games on Sundays because Sundays is just part of the rhythms of life in this country now. I know how st stupid that might sound and pie no, in the sky I don't it might it sound. It sounds stupid at all. I you know, think. just that there's there's a rhythm to and a stability in, okay, the NFL is the most popular in, entertainment institution in this country. It plays its games on Sundays, one on, one on Monday night and one on Thursday, and that's fine. We don't need to have games on Wednesday nights on Christmas. We don't need to have games in Brazil. The league is better when it's that sort of – it's maintaining that sort of predictability and stability. And like I said, maybe I'm really wrong about that, but I think the more the NFL gets away from that, the more it risks what it's built. And I'll just give you a personal insight because we all see this through our own individual prism. Playing games in Brazil, a game in Brazil. Yeah, it just happens to be an Eagle game, which affects this market more than any of the other markets. Uh, do I like? No. Am I okay? Fine. Uh, I'll be ready uh, Friday night. I'm in because uh, I already have prism because. I'm a WWE fan, so I pay for it anyway. Peacock. Uh, did I say Prism, I You're going peacock. way back. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about back. that. Meant Peacock. Yeah. Um, the fact that uh, they're going to spread it out over a period of the, the week at a Wednesday game, whatever. Do I like it? No. Does it make me crazy and make me want to say I'll give up the NFL? No. What does bother me is just streaming in general. That Did you see the stat that of the people that signed up for Peacock, not Prism, uh, during the NFL playoff game that was streamed this year, they retained 71% of the people that had never had Peacock before. They took it specifically right before that playoff game and kept it. That is a huge market move. And if they got that streaming is going to be just elevated and become a bigger thing. And that bothers me more that they're selling out, that they're making you pay for your football games. You have to have a service to pay for your football game, more so than an expanded week or a game in Brazil. That's just me. How about you guys? I mean, I look at it this way, Jody. Um, I haven't cut the cord completely. I still have cable. So do okay? I. Okay. And, and part of the reason I do is that, again, maybe I'm a dinosaur here, but I eventually think that these networks and these streaming services and these leagues are going to go back to having to bundle this stuff because it will get cost will get prohibitive for people. You yeah. simply can't a la carte every single streaming service that you want to be able to watch every single thing. Uh, the, the bubble will burst at some point. And so I, I understand what you're saying. On the one hand, it's kind of the wave of the future and that we're going to pay-per-view some of this. And, and that's my other fear is that eventually they're going to pay-per-view the Super Bowl. Um, but the other hand, it may just the pendulum may just swing back because the market can't take you know, everybody saying, you know what, I'm not going to bother signing up for Amazon or Hulu, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Well, I think you're right with the bundling at some point, you know, and they've already done that when it comes to this right. perspective, uh, sports sort of tier with a bunch of the companies coming together. We'll see if it, it, it comes to fruition, but I do think streaming is going to be part of it. I think 
cable, unfortunately. And I, I'm, I'm a dinosaur too. I'd rather. Yeah, the bother. reality in a couple of years. To go back to your point, Mike, original point. I always, I always say, and I, I've told Jody this. You know, when Sports Business Journal or somebody like that does their most powerful people in sports. They always have Roger Goodell and Adam Silver and all those types of people. It's really the TV executives because they're the guys signing the big checks, whether it's cable, uh, linear TV, streaming, and they want the product on Black Friday. Amazon wants a Black Friday game. Um, Peacock wants a game because NBC, Comcast, they want to make sure Peacock's healthy down the road. We need a game for Peacock, and they cut the big check. So in some instances, I get why the NFL has to do that, and I don't know how you turn that spigot off, so to speak, because those are the guys with the golden goose, and if they're giving you the money, you got to give them the product they want. How do you fix that? I'm not sure how you fix it, and we haven't even mentioned the other factor, which is humongous in this equation, which is gambling. Sports betting, uh, you know, having a standalone game makes it easier for more people to bet. It just does. Um, they can focus more. They feel like they can concentrate more. I mean, talk about an industry that thrives and profits on uh, abu the abuse of it by its customers. The gambling industry is right at the top of the list. If you're a prudent gambler, you know, these, these DraftKings and sports books and the leagues don't want you. Because well, now you're going I'm down. Now you're you. going down a wormhole. What's the countdown to scandal, Mike Sielski? Because it's coming. It's already happened. It, 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 you know, we're having to deal with Temple. I don't know how that's going to unfold in college basketball. You've seen certain circumstances. Now the NFL's got this goofy hip drop tackle. How easy it would be for an official? I've said to Jody, throw a flag, fifteen yards, change an entire game. How close are we to that big gambling scandal? Very close because of prop betting. Because you don't have to shave points. You can change a score, change a, a rebound total. Uh, you know, look at an NBA game and all the statistics that go into the box score and the extended box yeah. score of a basketball game or a football game. Uh, and if the athletes or the officials are aware of that, the possibility for abuse is, is absolutely there. Uh, and I'm afraid we're starting to see it. And once, once that happens, once you call into question what you're seeing on the fields of play or on the courts or the ranks, professional sports has a major, major, major problem. I will say this, and I don't want to come off as Joe Gambler guy, but I do understand it and have an app on my phone and do play. They do cap the props. It isn't like you can go out and bet a million and a half dollars on under three rebounds for a player like the kid from Toronto, who all of a sudden got poked in the eye. Oh, got to come out of the game. Got sick, had to lead the game after three minutes. And they basically came back the tide that bets were made to his unders on his props. There aren't, there, there, there are protective measures in place. So you can't, uh, take advantage of that as as much as you could just a regular bet but a, a controversy is a controversy and i'm with you guys i think it is coming at some point um what's coming with the eagles in the draft mike sielski we're getting close now we're only weeks away from the draft and everybody likes to think that they know exactly what the eagles are going to do none of us know we got no idea but we could take educated guesses first round pick will be what position mike sielski offensive line Oh, yeah, like Mullen. everybody's everybody's going down. I'm I'm starting. I'm to not. Scare. I, you're not. You're not sucking me. And if they take an offensive lineman, it will be believing in our interior. I do not believe they're taking an offensive tackle in the first round. I do not believe that. I don't believe Harry Rhodes is going to do that, even though he is well on record as saying, "When in doubt, always go into the trenches." Lane Johnson's playing a minimum of two more years. Uh, my lot is playing however many more years. There, after Nolan Smith gave them what he gave them in their first round draft pick, they're not going to take a tackle and go. All right, we'll just let him sit behind Lane and and my lot. I don't, I don't think that. Well, happened. that wouldn't be the goal. He started guarding, right. and pick out. Yeah. yeah, Jody, on paper you're right. In reality, we have absolutely no idea how long Lane Johnson or Jordan Mailata 
is going to play. We have no idea. And the Eagles have made it clear. Oh, geez, that's just yeah. what what's that, John? No, I froze up. That was my uh, okay. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Um yeah, we have no idea what's going to happen. And the Eagles have made it clear that the offensive and defensive lines are where you win and lose football games. Look, go back. Don't go back to the Super Bowl year. Go back to 2021 when Jalen Hurts was in his first full-time, first season as a full-time starter, when their skill position weapons were not nearly as good as they were the last couple of years. They were able to win nine games that season. Why? Because the offensive line that year was better than it was even the next year. Agreed. 2021. And if you have a great offensive line, it is the ultimate equalizer in in this era of the NFL. And the Eagles would do everything they can to bolster it. Uh, and it would stun me if they don't take an offensive lineman in the first round. At Mike Sealski, make sure you follow uh, Mike on X. Does a tremendous job. Philadelphia Inquirer. Read them there. Sports Radio, WIP. You can listen to them there on, on the weekends. Does a tremendous job with Glenn Mack now, as does... Jody Mack, uh, those guys split those duties. So, uh, and when's the book coming out? When are we, when are we the, the history uh, of the slam dunk? Yeah. Next February magic in the air, the myth, mystery and soul of the slam dunk coming out in February. I am going through edits on the manuscript right now. Nice. I'm going to get February, that autographed, man. uh, Mike, cause I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one big hit and loved the history of the slam dunk. I think it was a great idea. Um, looking forward to that, uh, but getting it back to end it with the Eagles and, and the draft, I, I start to look at Nick Sirianni and I say to myself, I listened to Jeffrey Lurie. We talked about some of the global stuff when he was talking about the Eagles. He made a big deal about the coordinators, Mike, and how good they were. Are, are we at a point where this is clearly a, a make or break season for Nick Sirianni? If they don't reach, insert the expectation at a high level, is this it? Are we talking about a lame duck head coach here? Yes, I think we are. Uh, Jeffrey Lurie's made that clear that he's willing to move on from a head coach. Uh, whether it's Doug Peterson who won a Super Bowl, whether it's Chip Kelly who didn't say hello to him in the hallways and didn't attend the Christmas party. He didn't party say and, hello to anybody. <laughs> and all of that, Jeffrey Lurie will move on. And – Look, the end of that season was bad. It was really bad. And I like Nick a lot personally. Uh, I think he has some growing up to do uh, as an in-game coach and in the way he carries and handles himself. And I think some of that spills over to how he handled those final seven weeks of the season. Uh, and it was – I mean, think back to that Tampa Bay game, guys. It, there, I, I – Came away from bad. that game that thinking bad. they're absolutely going to fire him, especially yeah. given the other head coaches who were available at that time, Bill Belichick, Mike Vrabel, uh, yeah. Pete Carroll, et cetera, et cetera. So if Sirianni can't show this season that he's up to the task of bringing this team back from the depths it fell to, Jeffrey Lurie will move on. Yeah. But I, I real quick, Jody, I arrived, Mike, in Tampa saying there's no way they're firing Nick Sirianni. And then I watched that game. And and you know, Tampa is sort of an old school stadium. So some of the Eagles people are right behind us in the press box. And one executive that will remain nameless, I won't name him, said at the end of the game in the fourth quarter, just frustrated, fucking embarrassing. That's how he described it. And I said, Boy, I don't know how he survives this. Um, so I left thinking maybe they will fire him. Um, but yeah, I think it's make or break. I'm with you 100%. Sorry, Joe. That's okay. For those of you uh, just going to try and hammer on my point here, um, Mike, uh, specifically for you, John, if you want to chime in, feel free. Um, who's on more of a hot seat, Eagles coach or Cowboys coach? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I would say the Eagles coach. I would say Sirianni. I, I would, would say Sirianni too, because as strange as it sounds and as the people speak, Jerry's the more consistent one than uh, Jerry. Jerry's Jerry's very, he's got that reputation from 20 years ago. He's gotten very conservative as he's gotten older. All right, so <laughs> let, let me change the question. Who should be on a hotter seat this year? Sirianni or McCarthy? Well, I mean, I think it depends on how you want to look at it, Jody. Jerry Jones is looking for a certain 
um, style of head coach, one who really goes along with what he wants to do and his whims and his decisions and those sorts of things. Uh, and that's why he stuck with Jason Garrett as long as he did. I mean, it was really pushed to the breaking point before he finally said enough with Jason Garrett. I think John's right. Jeffrey Lurie is a little, you know, there's a little bit more of a whim there with Lurie. We're like, okay, we haven't won in a couple of years and, and Nick's pushing back a little bit. And remember Nick's personality is different from Doug Peterson's. Doug was a go along to get along guy until he won the Super Bowl and wanted to assert himself a little bit more. Nick's naturally, Hey, I'm going to do it my way. So I still think Nick is going to, it's a struggle for him to hold his tongue in a way that it, you know, it wasn't for Doug. And if, I if think it doesn't go well, Jeffrey's going to be inclined to make a change. Yeah, Mike, I, I do think you're right, but I think Nick's also more of a, a, a political animal. Like I hmm. think if, if, after this season, and we went back and forth, did Jeffrey force him to fire? It didn't matter. We knew he was going to fire the defensive coordinators. Right. Um, offensive. So it comes down to Brian Johnson. Was that forced or was it unforced? And I think it doesn't matter because Nick probably read the room. He said more and said, if I don't change, I'm yeah. in trouble. I'm out of a job too. Yeah, yeah. So I think you're right. He does stuff his own way, but he's also a better politician than Doug Peterson. Fair point. And I'll go one further. I think the Giants head coach would be on a hotter seat than the Eagles head coach. I think he is on a hot seat. their collapse. Um, and he had a good first season, but their overall collapse. They had a seasonal collapse last year Did the Giants, and I don't think that he's a lock if they stink again this year to be back. So out of the four teams in the cover, the only one who's on a less hot seat for baby. me is Dan, Dan Quinn. Quinn, who hasn't coached yeah. a game yet. He's yep. at the head of the line. Welcome and to our, the NFL, guys. This is how they maintain our interest, or at least yeah. part of the reason they can. They're very good at that. Mike Zielski, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for hopping on. Uh, we will get you back up before the draft. Thanks for doing it with us today. Anytime, fellas. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Be here with us on Birds 365. Speaking of the draft, we're going to have a uh, new guest. I haven't had him on the uh, Birds 365 show before. I've had him on my CBS Sports Radio show a couple of times. Luke Easterling, draft insider for Athlon Sports, is going to join us coming up in just a couple of minutes. When we come back, I want to talk to John about the backup quarterback signing in the NFL yesterday. Strange bedfellows in Kansas City. I uh, do want to get uh, some commentary out of John on that. You're listening to Birds 365 here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel.